Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Antichamber Podcast. And I have with me here uh, Groovy Moss. Hey, how's it going? It's so, it's, I, I just, I really want to start off by saying, holy crap, look at this image that, that Lilith made for this podcast. Oh yeah, fantastic! I I really enjoy the uh, the color palette and the creativity of it all. It's so the the color palette is really interesting because it's it's a little lighter than the others. Um, which is all of, most of the other Doctor Vex images are really um, like they're they're they kind of have a darker palette, like darker reds, darker greens, and like tub dogs. Yeah. And anytime that he interacts with any of the other characters, it's like a lighter color. And here, with your character oh, yeah. you've brought, is is kind of a lighter, a little lighter tone to our podcast here. Um, right. And, and I like uh, to think that the uh, the little flowers are actually like kind of bioluminescent, so they're like lighting up the moss, like little firefly type of deals. I, yeah, that that microphone is a really cute idea, like, <laughs> like the little team. Oh like, yeah, like they're kids or something. But, yeah, um, yeah. Oh, for sure. I I like the idea of these little characters kind of just being young and they think that that's you know kind of how cables are run or maybe that's how they are actually run just through the vines you know through living things what what we've got going on for the dr vexy universe is, is I, I think really something really something special oh yeah especially with character design and now that we're going to be introducing the nurse of Nosun, we we have three more little little characters of orphans uh the adopted <laughs> orphans of the, the clinic <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, I'm so excited for those little guys and just to see them, you know, hopefully on on something uh, like just some fan art. Like, I would love to see more fan art of, of the channel and just little sketches well, I mean, even. That's, just That's, I think, I think the fan art is single-handedly my, my favorite part. We we ended up getting some, some fan art right in the beginning and it, I, I, I think that I almost cried. <laughs> Because it, yeah, <laughs> and and the reason why why I love it so much is that it's, it's you know I've, I've mentioned this before on other people's on other people's podcasts is that they took the time out of their day to sit down and and think about me and and think about like the channel and all the things that we've done and now that's a part of their life that they want to spend their free time you know creating something. Right, I feel like uh, I feel like that kind of feeling doesn't come around too too often you know unless you're in uh kind of like a, a not to say business but like if you're in the same area as this if you're doing the same kind of thing as a as a hobby as a passion project i mean it comes from like a very odd place that you know people typically don't feel that kind of gratification being like wow you took the time out of your day to draw an image about something that i thought of like, <laughs> right, and, and the whole the whole Doctor Vexy idea was it was really fast. Um, it yeah, was, it was an idea that we all kind of came together on. Um, because I, I I remember oh my god this was like this was like maybe a year and a half ago at this point. Um, oh man, I think really it's been a little longer. I I started the channel in November of two years ago. So, yeah, so, so 2020. I, I, yeah, back in back in 2020, I started this in November, and um, and I remember talking to to our, our channel artist, and mm-hmm. we we were just coming up with ideas because we, we we knew the it actually didn't even start with Doctor Vexy. It started with us coming up with a color palette for the channel because we just we were brainstorming ideas for for what we would do for like the channel banner and, and the, the, the Twitter profile picture and what we wanted for for the the vibe of the right. channel before we went into it and, and what we agreed upon was like was like a deep forest green or maybe like a lime green and a, a black but like smoky warm charcoal kind of color and it, it eventually evolved into an idea that she had for creating for creating Dr. Vexy. We, we still have those concept art images, and they're they're my favorite. It, back in those wow. days, instead of being 
almost rounder that he is now mm-hmm. involved with his, his play Dr. B. He has yeah. the, the original idea he was a lot sharper, a little more triangular and, and kind of angular, really. Yeah, almost like uh, almost like Phineas from Phineas yeah, and Ferb. Yeah, he was, was very um, he was very Dorito esque at and first. Some of the numbers that we had from the original concept art we made into like actual like a, like official Doctor Dexy images, the, the ones that we use for our video. Um, yeah, and uh, I, I did want to I did want to transition into what this podcast actually is about. And this podcast is going to include all sorts of different stuff about the, the, the channel here. Um, I know that that now that we that we have Groovy Moss here on, on the channel, our goal <laughs> is to collaborate on, on different stories together. He'll have his he'll have his own stories on you know, and and he he of course has the lovely lovely voice talent of uh, of your character on on Rumen. If you want to tell me a little bit about uh, Mr. Franklin Stanklin. Yeah, yeah. Franklin Stanklin is indeed his name. Um, and my whole concept for him came up when it was, uh, we were in rural Pennsylvania. This is still when we're in high school. Um, I believe I was uh, like around 16 at the time so somewhere yeah somewhere in that range and uh that's like four years ago (laughs) yeah yeah we're not we're not super old (laughs) right i mean it was it was definitely very modern times that we kind of grew up in so um yeah i i wanted to make this little character for a one shot but it was supposed to be like just kind of a comedic one. I was supposed to just hop in. Uh, everybody was supposed to make a character for, you know, like a level two little dungeon. Yeah, that's and, yeah. It was supposed to be like a total of maybe two or three hours of gameplay, and then that was it for the day. Um, and I just recently got into it, so I didn't even know how to properly act. But I just said, you know what? I'm gonna give this guy a weird imagery. Um, so as you had said in Rumum, you said Sir Daniel DeVicio, the actor, famous, mind you. Um, a lot of people may not have... Uh, it was actually about Danny DeVito. <laughs> so so the whole concept image was uh, Daniel... Photoshop. Yes! I, I know that I flashed yes. in the episode. <laughs> And yeah, that so that was the one. So in, in episode five of, of Room Out, it's a very, very special episode to our hearts because I've, I've mentioned this before that Room Out is, the, the story is actually the first person perspective of our channel artist's D&D character. Yes. Um, and, and the story reads as the way that, that her character interacted with the campaign and it's a very very gorgeous narrative uh, about kind of her experiences and, and what she went through as the character and her internal monologue during the thing and and episode five was actually the very first episode that i ran for all of the boys back in Hanson. yeah yeah all of their characters and and we i i remember our very first session i i had everybody show up uh, with a letter of audience from the Queen. And yes. I remember the words of, of no matter how you got this letter, whether you stole it or you're giving it to you given it to you, um I, I remember that I, a lot of times in during the campaign I would print out I would print out things to give to everybody during the game. And that was like you? the one thing that I didn't print. Yeah. From way back. But that, to be fair, we also weren't, um, I mean, we were so young. We weren't even in the school, like, with our club at that time. Like, that hadn't even been formed. There was nothing. Yeah, there was nothing that had been formed about that. It was just, 
uh, basically, hey, gather at one of our friend's house. He lives pretty much in the center of town. So, you know, everybody that's uh, in the campaign, just come along, come over to the house. So it was kind of just like a, a throw on thing. And that's actually the first time that I've ever met you. <laughs> and the thing was, I don't remember it very well because I was absolutely just slammed. I was just absolutely gone. And so it was just one of those things that I used to just, I used to smoke a lot, smoke a lot of weed. And now I don't because I have stunted lungs. So like not great for you. Really just not great. Um, but no, it's, it was a really interesting time because I was so zoned out on the couch. I didn't, know you so i wasn't comfortable sitting at the table right, with you so right, i wasn't exactly. even into D. &D. that's i i what session was that oh oh you know what i do remember what session that it was that, that yeah you in on, and it hasn't been reached in, in room yet um no it hasn't but, so i'm not going to give any spoilers but by golly <laughs> but uh yeah the the episode five was was very it's very very special to us because everybody's original character from there and I, I back when I was writing it I hit everybody up and we're, we're talking about five is it more than five months ago something like that I I, oh, I hit everybody up and I'm like hey this is what I want to do for the story I want to get everybody's original D and D character now and keep in mind we're talking four years ago right in the beginning of when I was making Cal. Now, we're talking mm. session one of the very first time that I ran Cal. And, yeah. And I didn't... Now, when, when, when you hear about the Lord, the channel, and you look at all the documents and everything that I have on, on you know, all of, the, all of the, the stuff that I made for it, absolutely none of that was there uh, in the first session. In fact, I only had two, two towns, actually. It was supposed to be Arginia and Mythal. But instead mm -hmm. of instead of them being like capital cities like, like they are in my, in, my, in my continent, they were just towns. They were just large, large towns that just had the queen in it. And so I really didn't have too much of a plan beyond beyond the very first episode, which yeah. everybody's, everybody's very, very first kind of kind of characters that they were doing with with Cal and the what I asked everybody was basically, what were your thoughts during the events of the campaign? And and so that's why these characters uh, sort of act the way that they do. And, and you know, in, in episode five, uh, Ayla, the character of one of our very, very dear friends to us, um, <laughs> his character design was... Now, I'm, I'm definitely going to go into this in, in the story, but... But he's, his, his character's a warlock, and he didn't get his powers until that fight. And and I, I just think that that when when he and I were making make, making that session, we actually had that planned out ahead of time of, of when we wanted his actual thing to come in. Because it, it's very, very obvious that he can't use the sword. He can't. He, he's never right, fight. yeah. He's, watching, he's like he's, he's like a little baby. <laughs> he's a YouTube one. He's like the weeb of the medieval ages. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like you, you watch it. You watch a YouTube tutorial about how to do like, <laughs> like martial arts fighting, and here you are punching your pillows. But <laughs> right. But uh, uh, yeah, that was that one was so it was, it was very very near and dear. And your character actually wasn't even a part of it. You're, no, when, when not at all. Your character, I, I, I wanted you to be in there for... for. <laughs> Initially, the idea was comedic effect, but now your character is taking some arcs here. Um, but, uh... So far as, as like, the, the way that, that Romem was kind of developing, and the way that I set the scene is, is very reminiscent of the way that I ran the B&B campaign. And that's the same yes. way how I do all of the, the creepy pasta readings because I, yeah. I I fell in love with the idea of 
one person, a storyteller, the, the narrator, doing all of the voices by himself, putting, setting the scene, playing music, and that was my favorite thing. And mm-hmm. that was really a part of the magic of our first D and D sessions. Is I would, I would bring my. It started off with speakers, like little little tiny desktop speakers that plugged into my. I remember room. that. Yeah, and they were so shitty, and I was, I was messing around with them all the time, trying to make the sounds right. And at that point, I was running like YouTube video video game ambiance, and every time there was combat, I, I had a playlist of of old combat music from old video games. And um, dude, that's right. It, it evolved into music. Oh. Bass amplifier to oh yeah like, yeah we just that I think was one of the most magical parts about playing D and D for me and <laughs> not even just D and D like like storytelling in general reading a book watching watching a movie they all have the same ambiance and what I fell in love with was the ability for one person one sole person who is putting their intention behind every voice and putting putting the effort in there to, to make it as immersive as possible. And that's what I brought to the YouTube channel because I I think that, you know, if you've got the ambiance, you have the music, you have the, the voices, it just, it brings you there. And I think that's what, what makes it, instead of some like music, it's, it's tailored to the Right, and I really, I really like the topic that you've kind of got on here now where it's like just the voice is what sets the scene regardless of if it's good or not. I mean, you're, you're putting in the background music and everything like that. You got really in depth with it. I will say, I don't feel like many people would do that um, unless they were kind of into the more advanced tier. You did it, uh, you did it just because you had kind of good direction, I guess. I'll so I, I will say that I, I do have a very common start to D and D. Um, well, Actually, it, so I, what I was going to say was was it was Matthew Mercer. You know, he, he grew up watching Critical Role, and it's it really does make an impact if you do like something like DP. Um, but it, it actually went farther back, like playing Vampire Masquerade. You know, back when I was like, like twelve years old. Right. But you do bring up a really fantastic point in that the the voices don't they don't have to be you know, the highest quality. It's it's more the effort that makes the the attempt magical than the yes. action of it. Now, you know, you could whip out whatever good voice, but even if you do some garbled, like, like voice cracky, voice cracky thing, there's there's just that, that element of applying the love to the fact that you don't want to use your normal voice to a character, you know, like, if, if I, you know, it's not restricted, like, if you have a masculine or, or a feminine or a play or softer, whatever, whatever kind of voice you have, you can still make those fluctuations, and that is what I think makes anyone a voice actor, even anyone an actor, if, if they're, they're nervous about, about, you know, doing a voice or, or doing a character or a bit that it's just the it's the, the love behind it that you give and it's the attempt that still makes it believable and it doesn't have to be you know some some huge hollywood performance if i'm, if I'm talking about like if I'm, let, let's say let's say that that you have like a barkeeper right like, yeah i, I don't even I don't even have to give you all the details of the barkeeper for you to make an image in your head. You know, you walk in. Yeah. Hello there. What can I get you on tonight? We've got a special for a bar, and we've got a special on me. I mean, that's just a whole character, and the person that I've created with that voice is not the same person that you created, nor anyone in the audience. I mean, that's just... That's one of the magical parts about anything audio related. Tweaking it just a little bit will change the whole sound of it. So, you know, you were going on to say if you have a softer voice, like I don't have the deepest voice in the world. Of course I don't, but that's fine. 
that's fine because I can still do different voices. I can still fit different roles just because I'm not a dwarf. That's all hefty like that. Like, you know, I, I'm not deep like that or guttural, but that's fine because the voices that I can do don't have to fit that at all. Even if I just went, you look at the bartender and he looks at you. Mm-hmm. Hey, what can I get ya? <laughs> <laughs> and I look at him. And right. Looks at me. But um, <laughs> yeah, that's and that's so it's so cool because, and, and actually the whole reason of why I started that club in school was it was the and this is actually what I marketed it to the principal for because I know that <laughs> right. Yeah, that was that was a, an issue trying to get that club name, but I I, I made up a, a basically a presentation to him and my and my my idea was. Is I wanted to start that club because it was a way for people to interact with like-minded individuals who have interest in our tabletop club. It was all about mm-hmm. board games, the card games, and the tabletop games. It was a way for you to choose one of those, even if you don't know how to play one of them. And the people around you would, would teach you and include you, and that was a way to make friends. And, and specifically, when I was running the, the D&D, um, I tried to bring out the best in everybody's acting. And it was yes. Way for you to crawl out of your shell, to be less shy if you wanted to, to meet new people and join the game. And it got everybody voice acting. And one of, the, one of the baseline things is that I don't care. I really don't care what kind of voice you do. Try not to do yours because any voice that you can do is a character's voice. They're all someone's voice. Yeah. If you pitch shift your voice just a little more now, yeah, or... There you go, that's a character. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you, then you have somebody that's authoritative, or if you want somebody that's more shy, you might put it up into kind of a higher key, and, uh, I, you know, stutter a little bit, and kind of talk fast because you're nervous and don't know what to do. And that's a whole nother thing. And now after the description of your character has been given, not only do you have that as kind of a baseline to guide you in the right direction, you can now make them a whole person with their own voice lines in your head. Sure, sure. And, and you know, you, when, you, when you describe, like, your, your first EV character, the, the, the duster-wearing, you know, dark clothing, corner-of-the-bar type important NPCs for your, your, yeah. your rogue... Uh, who specializes in using two daggers, right? You know, you can set the scene and you can describe that character as you introduce yourself. And then you can look at everybody and just go, oh, hey! <laughs> right? Because that's like... Oh, right! And, and that's what makes the look, because it doesn't matter what the voice is. Whatever voice came out of that character gave it, gave it funny or gave it cool or gave it, gave it life. Yes. Just, it's so magical. And it gets people, and I've seen people in the club just crawl right out of their shell. And they're doing the voices they're getting anyway. Yeah, it really, it did bring a lot of people together with that club. Because and I will also say, say, yeah, I wasn't even a part of the club. I never participated in any of the campaigns, none of the one-offs. But I was just there because I was so interested in hanging out with you guys since you guys were my friends, right. even before the club, but the club brought us all closer together and it got me more interested in voice acting, in DT, in storytelling, narrating. It helped me climb out of my shell too. I mean, it was, it was something that really helped everybody in the group and it gave you a sense of leadership as well. Cause you now have, you know, eight kids that are in a room and you're just a kid too, but you're trying to organize it. And you can, and you can. And that was like, I'm sure that that was such a good moment where you just felt it. You're like, dang, I did this. I created this club that that the school has approved after much fighting. Like, and I, I do want to say that when I ran tabletop club, people were coming up all the time asking when it was, when we would do it. And we would just do it after school for like, what what did we do? Like, Like an hour? 
or yeah it was typically an hour um that we would have after school but sometimes if we were outside of the school's premises oh, like right. they would kick us out yeah, I, I did uh, we would head to a buddy's that. house right like sometimes they wouldn't have an area for us because the library was taken um oh yeah we had quite a lot of people and then the numbers started dwindling a little bit so yeah. they stopped giving us the the library as much then we moved on to a very kind teacher's room um that accepted us with open yeah, arms I think, I think that was my one of two of my favorite things about that yes when she who who was already working she was already working so many jobs but oh yeah they're so bad for the thing and she's like oh my goodness what you guys are doing is so cute i really really think that it's a fantastic idea and she became our our teacher because they wouldn't let us run it without a teacher to moderate it right basically administrative advisor like that's that was her role and she's, she's like <laughs> she was so nice and she's just in the corner like i don't know probably looking at her stock portfolio or 401k <laughs> trying to Actually, build it out the time she, was listening, <laughs> she was investing yeah. in the D&D campaign so so she would either be doing that or she'd be, you know, doing something random on her computer, looking really, really focused. And then she'd like look up for a couple of seconds, make sure that we're not stabbing each other or anything. To, to <laughs> she would suddenly start listening to us. Yes. Yes. They were hilarious because she would go, uh, hold on, hold on. <laughs> she just like gasp in the corner of the room. And then, like, like her fingers kind of like, hold on. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Like, 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 uh, like, oh, what? <laughs> right, like, well, I, we need to take a moment, just to step back, uh, really think about what you just said. <laughs> um, but I, I, I do think that the moment that made me the most proud, happy for the club, was when Wizards of the Coast sponsored us for when we were. Yes. Back. Yes, that was an awesome, awesome moment. For those of um, you, who, for those of you who, who may or may not know, when Wizards of the Coast catches wind of a school that has basically a, 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 a card game club at the school, at, at any, any school, um, you can submit a, basically like a, a, like a proof of club, you know? And, yeah. and you can give it to the company and they will send you a starter care package of basic decks to play and and cards and booster packs to, to collect. And um, so the, the teacher that, that ran our club um, didn't tell didn't tell me that she was doing it, but she submitted the form for us and got us sponsored by the by Wizards of the Coast. And so she surprised me one day and she was like, hey, I have all of these cards for you to give to these people to use at the club. Yeah, yeah. And the thing was, was I really liked it. They didn't have any stipulations. They weren't like, oh, keep them in the classroom. It was like, no, dude, you could just like, take them. They were yours. Yeah. Yeah. Right. These are your. You could just keep the decks. <laughs> like it's still there. I I think that it's still a thing in her classroom. There very well may be, and I hope that it is, because it brought a lot of people that didn't really feel secure or comfortable around others. It made them feel that way, because not only were there like-minded people around, but there were nice people around, and everybody was willing to help in that club, and I really hope that that energy is kind of carried through. And I think what was really nice is that almost, I think like every single one of the club members were also Spoon Gang members. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Yeah, Spoon Gang. Um, go, go ahead and kind of give the background on, on your whole entire job ordeal. And then, and then just go into it. Because this is something that I could explain, but it's, it's definitely done better by yourself. So I used to work as a as a character for a spring park. My character's name was, was Sprinkles, and he looked like a thug. And he had like the leather jacket and the studs and, 
and the black, I, I, I looked like the crow, and I had knee pads, I was a slider, and uh, I, would, I would grab people, and, and I'm, a, I'm a fairly tall dude, so the, the height thing was always really, really funny. Uh, but What are you, like nine foot two or something? Something like that. <laughs> um, but one of the, the funniest thing that I think I did with that character, and, and what I was kind of alluding to earlier when I was talking about like your first character, Rogue, with the, the goofy voice, is yeah. that was the goofy voice that I gave to my character. Like, the entire time, I would walk up to you, and I would be like, hello! But I would look so spooky and scary walking up to you, and I would walk up to you all, like, tall and, and creepy, and then I would just I would just be goofy at you. And, and people loved it. it. People would come back all the time, and, and they would come back for me. And so That's crazy. And, and so I, I was like, okay, well, I had just gone to, to Disney in Florida, like, recently from that time. And one of the things that I fell in love with was while you're walking around the park, they have these, these pins. Everybody, like, almost every single person that has a lanyard, and all of them are, are these things that you can collect around the, the, uh, the park. And you could buy pins, you could buy packs of pins, you could get like a 25 pack of, of Winnie the Pooh mm-hmm. pins, you know? And yeah, they were all, what, like enamel as well? Yeah, or were they, yeah, they were stamped? Some of the highest quality okay. pins I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> right. But oh, that's the awesome. Thing, the special thing for it was was there was a big pin trading uh, thing in, in Disney is and that you could trade a pin with any one of the cast members. And you, it kind of became like this game, like if they were like really, really proud of one of their nail pins, you could see what you can get from them. So if you've got like, if you've got like three Kylo Ren's a, and, and you know, like a, 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 a Doug from Up, that they, <laughs> right. they would trade you for their, their, their Tigger uh, enamel pin, you know? And, and right. And what's cool is that with some of those barbers, there were special pins that the employees only had. And what some right. had was a tiny little silver Mickey logo. And that you could only get that one from a park member. So you had to do the pin trading to get it. And that's how they kind of like circulated around. And I fell in love with that idea that you could only get the Winnie the Pooh, you know, enamel uh, uh, pin from this lady in the Magic Kingdom. You know what I mean? So hmm. it gave a certain love and, and life to, to every single pen, and it made it so magical, and that was part of why I loved going to Disney so much. But I took that idea, and off of Amazon, well, okay, so I took that idea, and I stole a bunch of, of utens- plastic utensils from <laughs> yeah. the concession stand, and I was basically pickpocketing people and giving them out, and I called it a safety spoon. Uh, it was like reverse pickpocketing, though. I don't. I don't think I, you I want know, to I just, I, I pickpocket people. Every single person's hoodie. And so what? What would happen is I would give people these these safety spoons, and uh, you know, I we also had like some kids go through, and, and I would give them like, I'm like, uh, this is your honorary safety spoon. Whenever you get scared, just hold it close to you or stab your mom with it. I don't really care. And it became this this icon of my character at the park that everybody had a safety spoon to go through the haunted house and everybody would come out and they're like, it worked, it worked, you know? And, uh, and I wanted to make it more special because people would come back to the park still with their safety spoon that I gave them the night before. So I'm like, okay. That's really, really cute. I want to create something special that you can only get from me. So I ordered off of Amazon a pack of a hundred bright purple spoons. And that became the thing that I gave everybody. And there was only a hundred. There was only a hundred in that, that first season. I did it for one year on, on that season and I bought a new pack the next year. And, um, I gave away a hundred purple spoons. You could only get that purple spoon from me at the park. And uh, 
everybody had one at the house. Everybody, every, there was only like a couple in circulation. And uh, when I was done working there, I still had some leftover spoons that I didn't know what to do with. So at our school, I decided to make fun of like the local, like the local wannabe, you know, crappy kids at our, at our school who made their like, their like gang click. And uh, I instead turned around and made Spoon Gang. And Spoon Gang was basically as far as it went for your membership. You got a spoon, whether it was whether it was a purple one or, or a white one. We, we gave you a spoon and you became one of us. And that was it. It really didn't go anywhere beyond, hey, you have a spoon? Yeah, I have a spoon. And they were purple, and and that was it. That, we we just gave spoons away to people, and they were a part of Spoon Gang. And it was this thing where we're where, where did you didn't Lilith make like like shirts for us at one point? We had a graphic design class um, that was mainly screen printing and making like little buttons and just that type of deal. So you were actually printing on shirts and stuff. And so she made her own custom design uh, of Spoon Gang, and it looked angelic. Um, <laughs> I still have my shirt. Uh, I'm sure that you still have yours. I do. I'm actually. I'm looking and at I know it. that there were. <laughs> hey, I have mine in storage for safekeeping. <laughs> um, no moths. No moths can get to it this time. But. uh. Yeah, there was only ever three of them made. Only ever three. She has one, I have one, and you have one. Um, and actually, I so actually I have... Oh, do you? I do. Lucky. I, I do. Lucky. I had two. She, I, she was looking for t-shirts, and I had like two blank t-shirts. One of them was like just, just some, some yes. old t-shirt maybe. Some, something like that. Some some normal kind of... All right. <laughs> yeah. And the other one was, a, was an old Versace shirt that I found at a thrift store. It was long. Yeah, it blood. was like... That Versace one... It was like a nice one, too. It was, it was very nice. It was, it was yeah. Nice I think I got it for like $10. But... Uh, yeah, oh yeah. But that, that Versace one think was the very first one that she did because, it was because i remember it turned out and, and that was the very very first one that she did when she was first learning how to do it and it yes was a little crooked. <laughs> yeah like, oh, yeah no, i'm so sorry. she freaked oh, out about it right um she's just like come back tomorrow and give me a shirt i got permission from the teacher to like just do this after school like come back tomorrow and give me the shirt um, I, yeah, so that's what it was. Now, I will, uh, I will also say that her making those shirts was like something so special because when we would have dress down days, you could like pay in a dollar to, to have the, uh, uh basically like support the football team or something. Yeah, something like that. So we had a uniform policy. And so whenever we would uh, have these dress down days, we'd pay like a dollar, five dollars or something like that. And then we would just wear the Spoon Gang shirts. <laughs> I I remember that. And um, that, that it was, was so, so fantastic. That was such a pinnacle point of, I think, our... It was all of those pep rallies. Because every time we had like a dress down day, there was a yes. lot of pep rallies. We had pep rallies like weekly. And it, it felt. We had a lot of them. Yeah, we did have a lot. Especially during like homecoming times. Oh, dude. They would do their, their like superhero costumes or, or whatever. Actually, we, oh, yeah. we ran quite a, quite a cool pep rally po- program. <laughs> yeah, they, they decided that they were going to try something new. Um, instead of reprimanding the kids all the time and just giving them, you know, uh, negative correction, they decided let's get them together. Let's, let's make them unified and actually work like human beings should together. 
So <laughs> they induced um, sociability into us by constantly having us get together. And, uh, and for some with chronic social anxiety, it was crippling. That was the um, entire corner of the tabletop where we all sat on those bleachers. That was an yes. entire square. Yeah, it was. was. All it was kids big. who just didn't want to be there. Right, yeah, it was a lot of kids that didn't want to be there. Um, myself included. But it was, it, now that I'm looking back on it, it was so much better than just having us sit in class all the time and not having us look forward to anything. I, I do think that that brings up a really good point. I do think that a lot of our ideas of how, how teachers ran the school, you know, back then when you were a chump, you're like, you're like, oh, what do these teachers know? All these teachers care about is this, that, you know, and, and you're like, I don't want to do my homework. All we do is, like, you know, whatever your typical bratty. Yeah. Angsty. Angsty, mean, cursing out teachers. Like, like, of course, we never did anything like that. But I believe no. a lot of kids we didn't. And <laughs> yeah. Think back at it now. I mean, they not only. Now that, now that I'm in the workforce, not only are they doing their job, their job that they get paid, not a lot of money for it, by the way, but... That is true. They came up with ideas on how these, how these teachers bought their own, like, classroom stuff. And it was all their ideas that they came up with just to make something. And, and as an adult, I think that I, I have a different appreciation for how much effort they put in. Now, I will say... Right. Oh, yeah, you you can't know. It's not that you don't want to know what they feel like. It's that you can't know because you simply haven't had the workforce experience. You haven't had to deal with any people. Like, yeah, it, it changes. Like, I work in, in retail right now. Right. So it's like I have a lot of customer service, you know, and that changed me. From being a person that was still shy, even in tabletop, and was honestly more quiet and just stuck to my specific click within that click. Um, even though I, I did, now I can talk to anybody about anything, anytime. I mean, it is so good to have just good people skills. And that is something that working has, you know, brought on to me. And I want to kind of lead that into asking any of the listeners uh, that have been, you know, tuning in and probably having questions, uh, you know, you have plenty of, of topics to discuss. Please, in the comments, write your questions. I don't care if it's one. I don't care if it's a hundred. Please, please, please give us ideas. We want to talk about what you want to hear about oh because... <laughs> it's fun. It's fun to. I I one hundred percent agree with you, dude. All you guys, I want this podcast to to heavily feature you guys because to me, to me the the audience is really. And we were talking about the fan art. Community. The audience is, is really what what gets you going on on this. This is what I love to do. This is what we love to see. We love reading all the comments and everything. And even if somebody, even if somebody gently, not not gently, if somebody like like even notions a little bit towards you know a, 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 a comment on a character in the story that they listen to, that yes. is like my favorite. The comments on the, on the the Mister Widemouth that we did, they were they were so sweet. They were so sweet. Yes, absolutely, and that was really my first time ever trying to voice act and at the time i just had a gaming headset microphone that was kind of plugged in and it's not it's not a good one by any means you know so it was it was pretty bad sounding but we ran with the whole high pass filter radio sound right. um right. just to make it sound it sounded like crap but we we're like you know what we can make a character out of that it's because it sounded like an old memory of a monster that you don't know existed or should exist or could exist. You know, you, you wouldn't know those things or if it was just like schizophrenic delusion. And so having that kind of in there, it was really, really cool. Um, just because the voice was different than my regular one. 
<laughs> and that was like my introduction to the channel too. Yeah, and it was it was a very very cute introduction, I think too. <laughs> yeah, brought a lot of personality that that you know I might not be able to bring to some characters. Uh, but yeah, everybody, everybody, the comments, the, the interactions, you guys, really, really what gets us, and and it's, it pushes us forward. We want to make more because if you love it, we love it. And the more that you guys are excited about content, the 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 more excited and the more engaged that we're gonna be when we when we right and um and, and it's it's really just I, I don't know about you man, but I just I love doing this. This is so fun. It is. It's it's more than a passion project for me. It's more than a hobby. It's it's some sort of lifestyle that I want to live that I hope to live, you know, because how cool would it be to say, yeah, I run a pretty successful YouTube narration channel with my buddy. Like, and by successful, I mean like really rich in fan interaction and just having a community that's there. I don't mean physically, monetarily rich. I don't care if I'm the next Logan Paul, that doesn't matter to me. I don't want that. Um, I just want my fans to actually care about us, about the projects that we're doing i want them to ask us like hey when is the next podcast coming out yeah. or you know when when's this happening um could you clue us in you know on the next episode of, of this like i just really enjoyed that part of it and that's that's really what that's really what pushes us forward to do all this stuff and that's that's really great yeah absolutely and really i think to to show our appreciation for all of you guys here, I did want to say that we have for you all a promo code uh, in honor of Groovy Moss joining us here. For on our merch website, if you enter in the code Groovy Moss at checkout, it'll give you 10% off of all of your orders. Yeah. Um, I, I really think that this is a good idea i just want you guys to be able to enjoy the same kind of stuff and and rep the cute merch it's it really is just very wholesome um and the 10 percent off of it I mean, are they like i have in front of me here the uh the pattern mask that yes because she did she did all of this like all of yeah it was all her artwork and custom designs mm -hmm. I, I will say guys, the, the mask really holds up. I I've thrown it through about like maybe a, a half a year's worth of retail beating. And like oh my god, how many dozens of washes, my guy? I mean, it was so many. I just tumble drying them with towels and stuff, and they're still not all frayed and gross. And I will say, no, I'm not just hyping up our merch it's it is kind of basic but i love it so much because it holds up so well like i bought one of the shirts when you released the merch actually that i was your first order i believe yeah um so i got the first actual shirt in and it was really good quality now i will say i have it more of a collector's item just because i i love it so much but when i wear it i feel fantastic because it's not, it's not like that gross kind of like hug your skin type of shirt. They're, they're nice, man. And having 10% off that, I didn't even get 10% off. <laughs> and I was an employee. <laughs> but I think, uh, I think that'll do it. Thank you guys so much for listening. I, I really appreciate it. Um, and I appreciate all the comments on the past videos. Just kind of welcome me, uh, me in. Um, and I hope that y'all have fun with that 10% off code. Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, we'll catch you in the next one. See you guys. Bye.